logic and math start their explosion. It's amazing how much happens early in the 1900s. Yeah. And late in the 1800s, you had Maxwell with Maxwell's equations, which describe all of electricity and magnetism. You had Kurt Gödel and a bunch of other math, Kurt Gödel specifically for logic, but a bunch of mathematicians who finally developed the axiomatic approach to mathematics that we now currently use. You had Einstein with relativity. You had the birth of quantum mechanics. So much happened early in the 19th and late in the 18th century. Crazy things in the war. Uh, not necessarily. That helped with the Manhattan Project, but relativity was well before that. I mean, if anything, the war distracted great minds from the theoretical to life. The war probably helped with things like developing uh, nuclear physics. It took from taking our continent and putting it in reality. No, Einstein, he was well on his way well before then. The, the theoretical always has to be developed before the applied. Typically, theory is way ahead of application, and application lags behind. Yeah. So the only reason Einstein was able to do his work is because, you know, two centuries earlier, a guy by the name of Gauss started some work down the field, and Einstein just, just he, he made massive breakthroughs, but he was continuing off previous work. Anyways, we can have a little bit of that discussion if slash when we ever get to Euclid, because Euclid was pretty much the state of the art until that. Uh, let's see. So we're talking about Aristotle. Uh, we're not on that. We were summarizing. I think here's where we left off last time. So last time we finished up trying to give you just a map of roughly what Aristotle's uh, view of all bodies of knowledge looked like. And there was the organon, which embraced everything. Everything. The organon is relevant to everything. The way that I summarize an organon is it's like the science of science. It's how we do science, and he has this particular field of science. And he broke them up roughly into three categories. We had our theoretical philosophy. This was when we're studying things for the sake of knowing them. The end here is true, truth. We had our practical philosophy. I am take, well, in theoretical philosophy, three major branches in there. We had metaphysics, mathematics, and then natural philosophy. Under natural philosophy, we'd have things like physics, biology, psychology, kind of what we currently think about as science is all natural philosophy. Then practical philosophy, the end here is action, doing. The end here is good. So here we were after the true, here we're after the good. So the two works on that are ethics and politics, but he stresses here, you can read all the works on ethics you want, that doesn't make you a good person. You have to go out and actually do the action. So here it's enough just to know, you're good. You can read the book and just know. Here, if you want to be good, it's not enough to just read the book. You gotta go do the actions. You gotta uh, cultivate the habits. That's how you become good. And then the productive portion, productive philosophy. Here, mostly interested in poetics and rhetoric. That poetics term can be a little bit misleading. It's not just dealing with poetry. But here, the end is making. Here, the end is the beautiful. And once again, it's not enough just to read. If you want to become a master cobbler, you gotta go do a lot of cobbling. You can read all the theoretical works on it you want, maybe some of them help give you some insight into some of the things you're doing, but ultimately the way to get good at it is to go practice the art. That's the way you produce beautiful things. So that was the rough overview of what does map look like. The organon relevant in every branch of philosophy, in every study. We always need to be logical in our arguments. Uh, roughly speaking, what he covers in the organon is logic, he covers language, because we use logic and language in all these fields, and he covers basic facts of reality. So he says, it doesn't matter what field you're in, you need logic, language, and basic facts of reality to produce arguments in those fields. Uh, so any questions before we go on? What was uh, metaphysics again, I forgot. Metaphysics is a study, the way that Aristotle would say it is, metaphysics is a study of being qua being, being as such, being in and of itself. Here we're interested in being. We're not interested in how a particular rock falls. That's way too specific. We're just interested in being in and of itself. The first science. It's more like a spiritual thing? Uh, a spirit would be a metaphysical entity. Gotcha. Okay. So, anything else before we start jumping into these? 
Uh, oh, one more thing I want to stress again. I think I stressed this last week, but never heard so much stress. So remember, relative to all the other philosophers we covered so far, Aristotle and Plato, they're like this. They believe in objective good, objective morality, objective truth. They're pretty close to each other as far as those things go. Now, throughout the rest of this lecture, we're going to make it look like Plato and Aristotle are like this. And we're going to make the difference between it very clear because there's also a lot of differences. So it's not that the opposite of Aristotle is Plato. As far as philosophers as a whole go, they're actually pretty close to each other in their thinking. But now I'm going to make them look like they're like this to make a very definitive difference between the two and how they differ. Make sense? So that's what we're going to focus on for a second here. Because remember, when it comes to the full system of philosophy, so Aristotle, when he starts a topic, what does he do early on in the works a lot of the time? He quickly says what all the experts before him have said on a topic and then gives his little analysis of what they said, then continues from there. Now, that, when, when he does the metaphysics, for example, he's going to be going all the way back to Thales. But then when he's doing a topic like ethics, there's not as many predecessors that come before him to talk about it. And so in a lot of these works, the only person he really has to contend with is Plato. So that's why it often seems like there's a huge difference between Aristotle and Plato is because he's always making reference to Plato, but that's just because Plato's the only one who really dived into that topic before him. So that's why there seems to be that kind of economy. Okay, so <coughs> trying to help give you high-level view for how Aristotle thinks and how he differs from Plato. So while he follows Plato's basic outline for systematic bodies of knowledge, he is entirely opposed to Plato's basic premise, and hence the world of forms. Now, remember, Plato's everything comes back to these world of forms. Metaphysically speaking, there's a world of forms. When we talk about epistemology, how we come to know things, we know the forms. When we talk about beauty, oh, that's a form. When we talk about uh, morality, it comes back to the forms. When we talk about ethics, even, it was all about we design a state for manness, not for men. Everything came back to these forms. So if Aristotle is going to reject the, the world of forms and the forms, you can see how that's instantly throwing out Plato's whole philosophy, which is what he's going to do. So he likes what Plato's after. He says, what you're trying to accomplish with your system, that's amazing. Turns out your system in and of itself is garbage, and we need to start from scratch. And he says, you go way wrong right with your basic premise. So let's try to recapture Plato's basic thinking Summarize it real quick for why there must be this world of forms and roughly how he views reality. So Plato, roughly speaking, he starts out with the premise, reality is knowable. So that's where he starts. Basic premise, reality is knowable. Now, what's known is universals, right? That's what we can have knowledge about. We have knowledge about universals even when we talk about a particular thing and we're trying to state things that we know about it. We still state it in terms of universal. So here's Donnie, a particular man. If you were to tell someone about Donnie, what would you tell him? You tell him stuff like, oh, he's a teacher, that's universal. He's 5'9, that's universal. He has dark hair, that's universal. So even in describing particulars, we still do it in terms of universals. So Plato's saying, reality is knowable. The things that are known are universals. So universals must exist as a part of reality. You follow the leap there? Reality is knowable. The only things that's knowable are universals. So uni universals must exist as part of reality. Yeah. Okay. This world contains particulars and not universals. I don't see chairness. I just see that chair and that chair and that chair and that chair. I don't see manness. I just see us. So this world contains particulars and not universals. And yet we know that universals must exist as a part of reality somewhere. Who knows? Somewhere. We know that they're not here in this world. Therefore, there must exist a separate world of forms, which is the real reality. So he kind of breaks that up in two steps. He says, universals must exist in some separate reality. Now let's see which one really is reality. And we did like a compare and contrast of the two. It turns out the world of forms, that's the real reality, and we're nothing. We're a shadow of that. So, uh, there exists a separate world of forms, which is the real reality. This world is a reality, but a shadow of reality. And so we can know nothing about this world. When we talk about the things of this world, according to Plato, we can have opinion at best. We 
can't have knowledge. All knowledge is about universals. Universals are forms. They exist in the world of forms. All our knowledge happens to be about the world of forms, not this world. Follow all that? Mm -hmm. And so things of this world, just an illusion. Sounds like Plato. Just shadows. Do you not count how Plato said it? That's what we're describing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we're summarizing Plato before we get into Aristotle. I gotcha. Okay, so that's what we were after then. So now, what does Aristotle say to this? Well, first off, the, the thing that's going to drive Aristotle nuts about this philosophy is this piece right here. We can know nothing about this world. So Aristotle says, you come up with this big, old, elaborate theory, and its great conclusion is, ignore the basic facts present to you. Aristotle says, that is so backwards. We need to start with basic facts to develop a theory. If I have a theory, and I have basic facts of the universe, I just see and experience, and my theory doesn't conform with the facts, we get rid of the theory. We don't say the facts must be an illusion. So that's one of the main ways Aristotle is going to contend with Plato. says, the theory needs to conform with the facts. You can't just ignore facts that don't conform with your theory. So he says, you're doing it way backwards. So how does Aristotle talk about this? He says, first off, reality exists, and it's completely independent of us. There's just reality, it exists. We happen to be a part of reality. So there's reality, you happen to be some little piece, some little portion of reality. We happen to be part of reality, and we also happen to possess a soul which enables us to be conscious of and reason about reality. Not everything in reality has a soul, a rock doesn't have a soul, and not everything that has a soul is able to reason about reality. Animals, according to Aristotle, would have a soul, but they can't reason about realities. So we've got a very special type of soul, which is both conscious of and able to reason about reality. So you exist in reality, you happen to have a soul, which is conscious of and able to reason about reality. Our senses communicate facts of reality to our soul. So my soul is encased in this body, my body undergoes some motion, that motion creates a sensation through my senses, which communicates information to my soul. And my soul is then able to, my soul is first conscious of that information sent to it, and able to reason about that information sent to it. So our senses communicate facts of reality to our soul. If the facts of reality don't agree with our theory, then we throw, out the, th then we throw the theory out, not the facts. Reality is how our senses and reason tell us it is. It is a world full of individual particular things. That's real reality. It's not some other world of forms out there somewhere who knows. This right here around us is reality. So Aristotle is often called a here and now philosopher. He's very much interested in here and now, not the there and then. So Plato says there and then, back before you were ever born, you were in the real reality. There and then, that's what matters. Aristotle says, no, 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 reality is here and now. You're in it. This is our reality. And what's reality like? Exactly what your senses are telling you it's like. If your senses are telling you that something's hard, it's hard. If your senses are telling you a light's bright, it's bright. Now he also specifies that just because, well, I don't know if we want to dive into that right now. We can a little bit. Your first pushback against Aristotle might be, what about when our senses lie to us, right? Because our senses lie to us all the time. If I take a pencil and I stick it in water, then it looks like the pencil's bent. And I pull it out of the water, it wasn't really bent, your senses lie to you. Aristotle says, whoa, 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 your senses did not lie to you. Your senses communicated to you exactly how the photons, given more modern language, we're coming off of that thing. And you came to a bad conclusion. Your senses don't tell you a conclusion. Your senses don't say the pencil's bent. Your senses just communicate information about how the photons are coming into your eyes. And that's all it does. It just gives you information. Your senses can't make judgments. Your reason makes judgments, and only judgments are true or false. So you came to a false conclusion based off of the information that was given to you. You can't blame the information. You can't blame your senses. You're the one that came to the bad conclusion. Your senses can't lie to you. They can't make judgments. Only you can make judgments. And if you would have studied it closely and watched how it bent, you could have done a lot of scientific work and come and discovered something called Snell's Law, which tells you how light bends when it goes from one medium to another. And maybe we'll get that in physics. So you said it's not necessarily bad information? Well, what do you mean bad information? Not relevant to... 
What do you mean by relevant information? You have to make the judgment. You, the consciousness, the soul, that part of you makes the judgment. It's not the information, it's the soul. You make the judgment. The information in and of itself is just that. It's just information coming to you. Your brain actually fixes a lot of information. Like, for instance, the fact that you don't notice your nose even though you're looking at it all the time. Your eyes are automatically removing the nose from what you're seeing because it's irrelevant information and you don't even consciously make the decision. And oftentimes, for instance, when we look around, our eyes don't slowly move. They move instantly and we actually have two different images and it merges them together using logic inside the brain to try to give you a smooth experience. But in reality, it's not how it works. Right, so Aristotle's not gonna have a great distinction between what he calls a soul and what we would think of as brain activity. Okay. So those are gonna be very close to the, exactly the same thing in Aristotle's mind. And he would say something along the lines of, well, maybe on some level you choose to ignore that nose, and that you could pay attention to the nose if you chose to. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Now, yeah. now, my next uh, question is, how did he come to the conclusion that other animals don't have the conscious ability? He does a lot of work with animals. He has done a ton of studying of animals, so he's tested to see which animals seem to have memory and which ones don't. He's tested to see which ones can act on that memory and which ones can't, so. I'm just confused at why he came to the logical conclusion using reason that, uh, that animals aren't, don't have the consciousness of ability like we The most basic way that he made the argument is along the lines of, human beings are the only species on planet Earth that lives different now than they did a thousand years ago. That well, we make technological progress. We might be we better. We learn about things. Well, he'd say ultimately, how does it come forward and how, what, what does it ultimately produce? You want to cut it off in some part and you want to say, how do you know this little segment isn't happening? He says, well, if this little segment keeps happening over and over and over again and there's this incremental progress happening and it's possible for these species to learn and pass on knowledge and pass on knowledge and they find better and better ways to do things. And they do all the time. No, if I go take a lion now and I go take a lion 2,000 years ago, and have you compare them, you can't tell me which is which. Okay, are you familiar with wild children? That's not the point. Okay, the point is, is that based off the environment they, they're in and the condition, take for instance crows. But they change their environment. That's the whole point. The point is a society evolves as they incrementally obtain that knowledge. The point is change. It's not necessarily even progress versus deforming. It's now if I go take Parley, and I take him back in time 2,000 years, he's going to interact much different than his fellow human beings, even though they're the exact same species. Because the knowledge has been projected forward on in my life. Right. Take for instance, if I grab one of us and we put you way out in the middle and we just were taken care of by animals, you would act and behave like an animal for the most part. If you go study wild children, children that were raised by animals uh, never learned the ability to talk, they can't walk very well, and they never learn how to interact with other humans. Uh, right. And how animals behave. Right. So that just helps Aristotle with his point, saying, look, everything humans do, it's not instinctual to us. It's adaptive. We might be able to adapt really well. No, it's not instinctual is a point. Is The point is, oh, you have to learn you. those things. Yeah, I, I should listen It's to not you. instinctual. Okay, and so my point is, like, for instance, a crow will learn, observe that these nuts, whenever a car drives by, will run over these nuts and crack them, and it says, oh, hey, I put these nuts here, they'll get hit, they'll crack, and I'll get to eat what they're missing inside this nut. And they will do that, and then other crows will see that happening and learn the same thing. And pretty soon all the crows are doing it. They're putting right. nuts out on the road, waiting for cars to drive over and then eating the nuts. And that, I'm, what I'm saying is, I don't know where do you draw the line? How, why do you just draw a line? It seems like it should be right. So Aristotle will say, yes, yeah, sometimes it's hard to draw a line between this point and this point. Sometimes it's hard to tell an incremental difference. So he'd say, look, one thought experiment he did, he says, let's look backwards. We see simpler and simpler and simpler forms of life. And as we look at simpler and simpler forms of life, it gets to a point where it's hard to tell whether something is even living or not. That's right. Like so he says, yes, it's very hard to draw the line, but it's obvious that a lion is living and a rock isn't. So the extremes tell us that there has to be a line. So your inability to find that exact line doesn't contradict the fact that there isn't a definite difference. 
So where do you draw the line between humans and all our other species? If you try to break it down into one simple thing, you're not going to find it. Where do you see it on the large scale? Look at how humans live compared to how humans did a thousand years ago. Look at how any other species lives compared to how they did a thousand years ago. It's extreme. I understand. We're an outlier as far as animals go. But We're the only outlier. But his statement was that they don't have this consciousness or something. I, I want to make sure I read it properly. Where was it? No. So the thing that they don't have is the ability, he'd say, to reason about reality. They can understand a particular fact. He, he thinks that where it ultimately lies is they can't take two facts, combine them together, to come to a new conclusion that they didn't have before. Yeah. So an animal could, in theory, recognize that Socrates is a man. An animal could, in theory, recognize that all men are mortal. An animal could not, just knowing those two things, come to a conclusion, therefore Socrates must be mortal. That's the thing he thinks that no other animals can do. And he thinks that that's ultimately what underlies everything humans are able to do. Quite concerned that could be proven otherwise. And then all that, the other statement right here, which is what's more concerning to me, the sense communicates facts of reality to our soul, mm -hmm. is something that they're saying animals don't have. He's saying. No, no. Animals have that. Oh. Maybe we just happened. I'm describing what man has. So every living thing, every animal, he would say, has a soul. Yeah, okay. Which conscious... It's aware of its surrounding to some extent. There's varying degrees of consciousness, varying degrees of awareness. And getting information from their senses, I mean, he even knew that plants, the leaves would lean towards the sunlight. So he knew that they were interacting with their environment to some extent. The thing that differs man from every other thing, if we got toward the definition of a man, man is a rational animal. Man is the only animal capable of thinking rationally. So that's where he draws the line between men and other animals. I see. But yeah, we're not the only ones with souls. And we're not the only ones aware of our environment. Okay. So I think we covered all that. But the important part here, what is reality? It's composed of individual particular things. That's fundamentally what reality is. That is not an illusion, that's not a shadow of the world of forms. That fundamentally is what reality consists of. Okay, so let's briefly look at Aristotle's arguments against the forms. Now, it's not like you can go to one place and read Aristotle's argument against Plato's forms. It's just that as they come up in separate places, he gives his general pushback to Plato in a bunch of ways. So I just picked a few that are common pushbacks Aristotle gives when Plato's forms comes up when he discusses previous philosophers on topic. So, what Aristotle has to say to Plato. So, first off, in opposition to the world of forms. So he says, even if the forms are real, even if you're right, Plato, they tell me absolutely nothing. Plato says that a shoe participates in shoeness. It's somehow a reflection of shoeness. But it's completely unclear what this relationship really, what this relationship is. What does that mean, that a shoe participates in shoeness? What did that actually tell me about the shoe? Nothing. He just gave me some analogy. So Plato largely, re largely relies on metaphors without making explicit how this actually works. There's a world of forms, this world, but how are they really connected? Plato never tells us. He just gives us analogies. He just gives us metaphors, which Aristotle resents. And Aristotle thinks that you can't do science this way. You can't use analogies and metaphors in your actual arguments. They can help with intuition, but you can't use them in actual arguments. Now, furthermore, since this world is unknowable, how do they even help? So he says, first off, they tell me nothing about my daily experience. Okay, maybe somehow they do and I can reason about it, but how do they help? Imagine that I had a cobbler here, and he suddenly came to know Plato's form of the good. How does that help him make shoes? That's what he's interested in. The cobbler wants to get better at making shoes. How does Plato's form of the good suddenly make him a better shoemaker? So Aristotle says, your forms are useless. They produce nothing for us. Even if they are true, they're irrelevant to what we care about, which what we care about is what's around us right now. That cobbler doesn't care about what he was then. He cares about what he's doing now, and he wants to be better at what he's doing now. That's what he wants to improve. So that's one of his pushbacks is, even if Plato's, he says, Plato's wrong, but even if he's right, doesn't matter. Another common argument he makes against him. The forms are meant to capture similarities, right? 
Universals capture similarities of forms are meant to capture similarities. The word dog applies to multiple similar animals. And so there must be the form dogness. This was Plato's reasoning. That's a dog, that's a dog, that's a dog. They have this similarity. Therefore, there must be this form dogness. However, don't dogness and my dog Bob have things in common? Doesn't that make perfect sense that the universal dogness and my dog Bob have something in common? Well, if they do, then they're in some way similar. If so, there must be some other universal relating dogness to Bob. And whatever that new universal is, that has something in common with my dog, Bob. And so there has to be some other universal. And we can grow his universals infinitely this way. This is called the third man argument because he actually makes this argument in relation to men. He says you have a particular man and you have manness. They have something in common. So now there has to be this other form between man and madness. We'll call it madness too. Now, a particular man and madness too have something in common. So there has to be some other form, madness three, etc. Hence, we get an infinite regress of forms. And just so you know, Aristotle didn't originate this argument. Plato makes this argument himself in his uh, dialogue called the Parmenides. That's one that we briefly went over. And this is how he attacks himself. He attacks his position. Uh, so Plato was very aware that his whole system, his whole theory, had holes in it. And he was just trying to figure out the best system that he could. It's one of the reasons that I don't think that, well, that's a tangent for Plato. We don't need it for Aristotle. Continuing on, another way he argues them. He says, the forms are self-contradictory. Plato says that since universal men are knowable as such, then there must be some form madness. The universals are what is knowable. So, since universal men are knowable as such, then there must be some form madness. Thus, every universal exists as a form in the world of forms, right? You and me, we all have madness in common. We're all men, so there must be this form madness. So he makes a particular entity in the world of form which he calls madness. And so each universal is a particular entity. Contradiction, we made a universal a particular entity. We turned universals into particulars. That doesn't make sense. A universal is the opposite. Well, not the opposite, but it's definitely not the same thing as a particular entity. So Aristotle says, Plato, all you're doing is turning universals into particulars, but just in some other place. Contradiction. You can't say it's a universal and a particular. That doesn't make sense. So those are three basic ways which he comes at Plato's argument for the world of forms. So quick summary with what Plato's out to do, or Aristotle's out to do now here. Thus, Aristotle is out to do what Plato did to demonstrate that there is objective and absolute good truth and beauty, and to do so in a way that resolves Parmenides and Heraclitus. So we gotta go all the way back to Parmenides and Heraclitus. We gotta restart where Plato started and we can't use his same system. So nice first attempt, but completely wrong, we're gonna restart. He wants a complete system of philosophy, except he wants to construct it without the use of metaphors and without reference to things beyond our experiences. I wanna start with our basic facts of the universe and construct our theory of philosophy in a way that's consistent with those basic facts of the universe. That's what he wants to start. And he doesn't want to allow any sort of analogies into his proofs. So, he starts out with the organon, which is going to explain what are the basic facts of reality and what are the basic ways that we can reason and the basic rules of language, which, well, maybe I can go over each of these briefly. So we're going to do the organon. This is the only one that we're going to do in good depth so far that I know, but we might do uh, a couple more. And the first work we're going to go over is a category, but briefly break over what we have in the organon. So the organon is composed of these works, the categories, on interpretation, prior analytics, posterior analytics, topics, and on sophistical reputation. We'll just briefly go over. Well, we'll just start off with the organon. We don't need to explain what each of these are in turn. The whole system, though, is meant to explain basic logic, basic facts of reality, and language, and then sophistical reputation. So you can guess what that's targeted at. Dealing with uh, the sophist arguments. So now let's jump into the actual organon. Uh, one more side note about things I'm going to do as we go through the organon. 
in case you try to do like my mom and actually read the work. <laughs> uh, since I'm trying to summarize a lot of things, I might interject a lot of information that Aristotle doesn't have right there at that place because it just makes the most sense to talk about it since I've got to summarize so many things and we're not going to cover everything. So I might be interjecting a lot at a place where he doesn't say that much, if that makes sense. Okay, so how does he start out the organon? Well, he starts out the organon talking about three different types of words. Univocal, equivocal, and derivative. Now, first we'll focus on univocal and equivocal. So, he's ultimately going to be arguing that we need to use univocal terms in science as much as we can and avoid using words equivocally. So what does it mean to use something univocally or univocal? It's the same word and definition. So what's an example of using a term in a univocal way? If I say, I am a man and Jeremy is a man, I just used the word man in a univocal way. It meant the exact same thing it did for me as it did for Jeremy. Now, if I say I'm a man, and look at this man, now I'm using it in an equivocal sense. What does it mean to call that thing right there a man? That is not a man. That's ink on a whiteboard. I'm a man. That's ink on a whiteboard. To call both of us men is to use man in an equivocal way. So we need to be careful when we're constructing our arguments that we use our terms in a univocal way and not accidentally in this equivocal way. And to see why this is so relevant, let's look at some of the past arguments that we've already dealt with and see how this is already coming into play. So a past argument that we've seen is something like this. The universe is eternal. With me so far? The universe is eternal, therefore the universe is infinite, right? If it's eternal, it's infinite. Well, if a universe is infinite, then the universe is boundless. Is that true? Yep. If it's infinite, it's boundless. Okay, if the universe is boundless, then the universe is infinitely large. Is that true? The universe has no bounds, it's infinitely large. What did we just do? We went from the fact that the universe is eternal to the universe is infinitely large. Uh-oh, there's a problem. How did we do that? How did we go from something infinite in time to it's infinite in space? We were equivocal with how we use this word, infinite. When I went from the universe is eternal to the universe is infinite, we meant infinite in time. And I can't go from the universe is infinite in time to the universe is boundless, unless I say boundless in time. And then if I were to write that, then here I could say then the universe is infinitely large, unless I said infinitely large in time. And then we'd agree, okay, this argument was good start to finish. So he says one of the things that's tripping us up by these early philosophers in their arguments, if you look at just any small piece of it like that, so if we look at just one arrow at a time, the argument kind of seems solid. It's hard to take issue with it. But when you look at the whole thing, your intuition tells you uh, something must be wrong. And then he says, it's coming down to being equivocal in our use with words like infinite. We need to be careful how we use these things. So univocal, equivocal, we need to try and use our words in a univocal way, as much as we can in the field of science. So that's why that's relevant. Next thing he talks about are derivative terms. We create derivative terms from existing terms, often by adding a suffix or prefix in the English language. In Greek, I think they only go one way. I can't remember if it's suffix or prefix. <laughs> one thing to keep a note, keep note of as we go through a lot of this. He's talking about a completely different language than what we use in this book. Our language is not the same thing as a Greek language. They're very different. I don't know what all the differences are because I don't know Greek. So some of the things that we come across might sound weird. Keep that in mind. He's always talking about the Greek language when he's talking about language and the type of words that they use. That's why I might accidentally mess something up. Anyways, so the next thing he talks about are derivative terms, and we still have derivative terms in the English language. Now, derivative terms are so great because they enable us to define a word once and then use a bunch of derivations of that word and not have to redefine it. So if you know what it means, then you know a bunch of derivations of the word thing. So if we look at the word right, and if I give you a definition of right, then adding that prefix re, we get a derivative term rewrite, and you know that means to write again, right? And so it comes down to, if you know right, you pretty much get rewrite for free. If you know what it means to care, you pretty much know what it means to be careless. Looking at one, we're going two ways. If you know what honest means, then dishonest, is just a derivative term from honest, and honestly is just a derivative term from the word honest. 
adding a prefix or a suffix. So these are derivative terms. So he's going to say, you just have to define that word, honest, and then derivative terms you get for free. So be careful with this, but once you define the top one, your derivative terms are free. Is he saying that that's a good thing or bad thing? To use he's saying it's a fact of how we use our language. Oh. So utilize it. So he, does, he discourages equivocal, but he, he likes... He discourages for you trying to define the word dishonest and trying to define the word honest and trying to define the word honestly and trying to define the word honesty and trying to define the word etc etc etc. So those are all derivative terms. You just need to find honest and then the derivative terms we get for free. So you don't need to... So he's encouraging them or not? He's saying then they'll know. Oh, so it's like it's a good thing. Like for instance, um, the drawing that you put there uh, is an equivocal version of a man, right? No. If I say Donnie's a man and that's a man, I'm using the word man equivocally. But if I was perhaps able to, because it looks like a man, but it's just a bunch of ink, is there perhaps a derivative way of saying that that's a man? No. Derivative would have to do with the word man that we're using. Once I define man. Then, I, then derivative terms of man we get for free. In other words, this, this is even the case with our language today. Chances are if you go look up the word honestly in Google, it's just going to pop up honest. Or the definition of honestly is going to be reuse the word honest in there somehow. It's just going to be some quick summary of how the Lee affected honest. What I'm saying is how if, if you can't use the word man, that's not a man, or you shouldn't be using that saying that's a man and you're a man. You should say, this is a drawing representation of a man, or something to that effect. And so if you Be careful. Time. The same way that infinite like this was bad, but infinite in time, now we're good. So if they had a derivative for infinite that referred to time or reality, maybe that would help. Not, this isn't, that's not derivative. That's just equivocal. Derivative is adding a prefix or a suffix to the word. That's what I'm saying. If they add a prefix or su suffix to infinite, uh, that way, we heard the word infinite. Oh, I know what infinite means. It means it's like it, it's forever. But then, in what context? Time or you know space? Well, you can have both. That's what this relies on. Once I specifically stated infinitely large, here it was implied going from eternal to infinite that this was infinite in time. So I used infinite in but an ambiguous was, way. Right, but it wasn't until all of a sudden you said boundless. But the way to fix this isn't replacing infinite with infinitely, the way to fix this is to specify exactly what I mean, infinite in time. So I need more words. It's not a derivative term. I'm what I'm saying so these two are related. These two have nothing to do with the derivative term. I understand. Okay. I'm simply saying, would it make sense to have derivatives for infinite that meant... We already have derivatives for infinite. The universe is infinitely large. I took infinite and put Lee on there, and you knew what I meant if, because you knew what infinite meant. And when I'm teaching a calculus class, once I teach a student about what infinite is, I don't need to say, and when you see infinite Lee, here's what I mean. They already know what infinite Lee is because they knew infinite, because it's just a derivative term. Okay. So derivative is not related to these. Yeah. Okay. So now he jumps into language. He says, in language we have, first he starts out with simple language. Language void of composition or structure. Typically single words. Dog, man, runs. That is simple language. Then we have composite language. Composite language is language consisting of composition and structure. The dog runs. A man eats. Here we have composite language. Now, what about language with composition and not structure? That's nonsense. I put it as cows the eating, but that would really also could look something like cows the eating. We gave it structure because I had to put in a line, but when you remove the structure from the words, suddenly you can end up with a bunch of nonsense. So we don't really care about that particular combination. So we're only going to care about these two. We care about language void of composition structure and the language that has both composition and structure. Simple language, composite language. We ignore this case. Okay, of all things that exist, this is going to be weird, but this is the crux of a lot of what we continue with here. So, very important. Of all things that exist, they can be predicated or said of a subject. So that's one thing. 
They can be in a subject. We'll explain more by what we mean by in here in a second. They can be neither of those, and then they can be both of those. So maybe draw like a square to show all four cases. So we can have predicated, not predicated, we can have in, and we can have not in. And these are our four cases. And everything falls into one of these four categories. So predicated is what you can say of a subject. What does it mean for something to be in a subject? We'll get to more example. We'll get to examples first before this will make perfect sense. But when we say that something is in a subject, we mean it cannot exist independent of the subject. We do not mean like your tongue is in you. I could rip out my tongue and still have it exist outside of me. That's perfectly fine. He means in, as in it cannot exist independent. Now we'll do some examples and then we'll take questions because I know. This is a lot to consume here in one bite. So we'll break this down a lot more. Uh, for those of you who have already done modern logic, the way that he uses in and predicated can both be replaced with just predicated. In modern logic, we just have propositions and predicates. Whether it's the way Aristotle uses in or predicated, both of those are covered by just predicates. Can you give a definition in case of modern of modern predicated logic. in this sense? With the way that he uses it? Yeah. No, I'm going to have to give you intuition with the yeah. examples. Okay. <laughs> Now, when I give the intuition, I'm also going to use this word substance the way that Aristotle does a couple times. A substance is just a physical entity. This is a substance. This is a substance. A physical thing. If you can touch it, it's a substance. Okay. Yeah. With me? Yeah. So let's break these down more and try to get some intuition for it. Each of these categories. But there's only four categories. There's one, two, three, four. Aristotle says everything, every concept goes in one of these categories. So let's look at some examples. So first we'll look at the not in, but predicated subject. So not in, but predicated. So the first one, put a one right here, this is the top line. Number one, we're talking about that category. Not in, but predicated. What are these types of ideas, concepts, things? Because we're talking about everything in existence. That doesn't mean just physical entities in existence. Whiteness, that exists. The square root of two, that's a thing. Is he Anything, about every spirit? concept. Like a spirit, okay. everything. Any concept you can make sense of with a word, we're talking about it. It falls among these four categories. That's what we think. So let's look at each of the categories and where typical ideas fall. So first we have the not in, but predicated. What are these? These are universals, universals, whose instances are substance. Let's follow that for a second. Yeah. You know the difference between a universal and a particular? Right? Now, whose instances are substances? Let's give you an example of each. Let's look at manness. Or we'll just say man. Is man a universal? What man? No, man. The word man. Is that universal? Yeah. Yes. Man is a universal. When I talk about a particular man, is that a substance? Is that a thing in reality? Can I talk about a man? Then you're good. That falls into this category. That is a universal whose instances are substance. Let's look at one that's not. Red. Is red a universal? Can I talk about a red? A red what? You see how you want me to put more on there? I can talk about a man. I can't talk about a red. You want a red something. You want that redness to be in something. So it needs to be in. We're talking about the ones that don't need to be in. They're not in. So predicated, but not in. Universals. Universals whose instances are substance. Think you kind of got it? it? It's a lot. We'll, we're going to cover this exact pattern twice because in two different ways, coming out from two different ideas because it's dense, but it underlies so much of what continues from here, so it's important. So universals whose instances are substance, physical things. You can point to one. It makes sense to talk about A, fill the universal. You're talking about this category. Madness can be predicated of James, but madness can be predicated of James, and when we say James is a man, but madness cannot be contained in James. Uh, there's no way for me to say it because we don't have the words for it. But to give more examples, there's ways that we can make sense of this category versus another category. So I see a man versus I see a rat. This one makes sense, this one doesn't. 
This is a universal whose instances, whose, is that what I said? Yes. Whose instances are substance. This is a universal where that's not the case. Another one, I see an animal. That makes sense. This is a universal whose instances are substance. I see a running. A running what? You want more. Can this has to be in something. Mean by not in again? Running cannot exist by itself. It has to be in something. It's not a oh, I can't exist independent. Yeah, there's no such thing as just running out there. Yeah. In the other room, I saw a bunch of running. Well, that one's still kind of words, but. I was going to say red, like photons, but it's actually more like a way we interpret a frequency for photons. No, you're going to get confused if you start thinking that way. Red, the way that they're talking about it, is the way, is the color you see when your brain interprets a photon of a specific frequency. The fact that we call that red light, we can't talk about red, we can talk about red light, oh. but we can't just talk about red. Hmm. So you still need the photon, the physical entity. Okay, so in means it's dependent on something for its existence. Red can't exist by itself. It has to be in something. Man can exist by itself. It doesn't have to be in something. That's what we mean by in versus not in. Running can't exist by itself. It has to be in something. Now the language seems a little weird here because remember, we're, this is all Greek just translated. Yeah. So it's gonna sound a little bit weird. I think it's more important to get comfortable with the four categories and what they are than the actual word choice of in versus predicated. And then we can go over what that all means. Well, it means this category. This is what he's trying to describe. I'm saying, you're saying, let's go over the in Oh, yes, I come at it. So this is my own way of making this make sense. And then I want to find another way someone explains it, and there's a typical explanation of what he's saying here. So I'll give you, this is me, and then I'll give you uh, what experts say. And then we can go over what. And then we can dive into it to your heart's content. So let's get through the four categories. Second category, both in and predicated of something. So universals without substance instances. Universals whose instances aren't some substance is what he's after in this category. So that would be some of the things we talked about up here. Running, running can be predicated of me. You can say that I am running, but running is also something in me in the sense that it doesn't exist independent of me. Redness, you can say that I am red, it's in me, but it's not something that can exist independent of me. Oh, you can predicate of me, you can say that about me, I am red, but then redness is also something that would be in me because it can't exist independent of me. So red and running both fall into this category down here, but so do other things that you might not have thought of, like geometry, a body of knowledge. This is another thing that can be predicated of me, you can say that I know geometry. Oh, sorry, you can say I am a geometer, predicated on me. You can predicate knowledge of geometry of Donald Timpson. How do you say that? You say Donald Timpson is a geometer. But then you can also say it somehow in me. The knowledge of geometry is in me. Right? Yeah. And if I get rid of every human being on Earth, every entity in existence that can hold geometry, where's geometry at? Right? It's not right here, this isn't geometry. So it depends on something to be in it. Something, geometry has to be in something. It can't exist in and of itself. So not only does it work for things like red and running, an adjective and an action, but a body of knowledge also falls in this category. And all bodies of knowledge fall under that, or just geometry? All bodies of knowledge, it's just another example. Remember. He is saying, any concept you have in existence, we can put into one of these four categories. Any words you can think of. Any I should be word, able to... Does it have to be one word, or can it be like a sentence or an idea? Uh, no, it, it doesn't have to be one word, because it can... So, pirate ship. It could be two words. Red bow. So it doesn't have to be a single word, but he, he'd say just a noun or a verb but he doesn't have notions that we do of nouns and verbs, we would say, if I talked about a red boat, we would say boat is a noun and red's just an adjective being applied to boat. 
Barry's office say he just calls that whole thing a noun. He doesn't have the concept of an adjective. Actually, he does. It's further on in the book. Of adjective, where he splits it off? Yeah. I don't see that. Where does he describe it? Yeah. I was listening to it, but it came across um, whiteness was the concept that was used in rudder in another part. Oh, okay. Understand. Yes. So you can talk about the adjective in and of itself as well. So you, talk, you can talk about red in and of itself as a property of something. Okay, yes. I meant when it comes to the actual diagramming of a sentence. They don't have, they don't diagram adjectives. No, you can't. They just have the noun and the verb. In there. No, the, a sentence does not fall into one of these categories. We're starting out with just the simplest just ideas. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah, still have notions of all those things. Like quickly, that's an adverb, but he wouldn't call it an adverb. Okay. Uh, anyways, so we covered that category. Okay. Next category. This one I think is weird. In, but not predicated. These are individuals without substance. Individual things, so not universals, individuals, but individuals with no substance. You can't poke them, you can't sniff them, you can't touch them, you can't taste them. Individuals without substance. So my knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem would be an example of it. That's a particular thing that is inside of me, or another one, would be like my memory of last week's class. So that's an individual particular thing. My memory can't exist independent of me, it exists in me. I can't sniff, smell, taste, touch my memory, right? And we're not talking about memory in the abstraction. Memory can be predicated of me in that I am a being capable of having memory. That could be predicated of a lot of things. But my memory of last week, that's in me. You don't have it, you don't have it, you don't have it. We're talking about an individual particular thing. It's in me. And yet, it's not something you can smell, taste, touch. It has no substance to it. Uh, so, um, uh, geometry being like a body of knowledge, and inside of it is like, for instance, the Pythagorean theorem. Uh -huh. Meaning, uh, things like red and running are properties of something. You know, if I was thinking. We will get to exactly how he uses the word property later. Okay, well, but you're trying to think about programmatically, yes. Yeah, I am trying to think of program, programmatically, and this is going to be more restrictive than how uh, object-oriented programming is. Like I was thinking of, like for instance, the property of a human would be an eye, but then an eye has properties in of itself, and then those properties have properties. And I was curious, how do you decide something is an individual when, in a way, everything kind of has properties? Like the Pythagorean theorem has uh, squaring, it's got um, building So triangles. we're not talking about the Pythagorean theorem, we're talking about my knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem. How I know and understand the Pythagorean theorem. We're not, because you can also know the Pythagorean theorem. We're talking about my particular understanding of that thing. So we're not talking about the theorem, we're talking about my understanding of the theorem. If that one's throwing you off, then go with the memory. I have my memory of last week, you have your memory of last week. Last week. Maybe those coincide, maybe they don't. Okay. But my memory is a particular individual thing that only exists in me. I understand that, but take for instance, geometry is universal because it embodies a lot of knowledge. Well, Pythagorean theorem, you could also consider it a universal because it embodies knowledge. Right, that's why I said don't think about this as the Pythagorean theorem. Right. My knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem. That's why I said if that's throwing you off, go with the memory example. That gives you better intuition. Okay. Your knowledge of a particular thing. Your knowledge of a particular thing and my knowledge of that thing aren't necessarily the same thing. Maybe they align, maybe they don't. Could but it's still yours the same and mine. Thing about geometry? Well, he means the field geometry now. Yes. But there could be a field of Pythagorean theorem, technically. Yes, you can talk about the Pythagorean theorem as a universal. So the Pythagorean theorem is up here. My knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem is down here. So my knowledge of geometry is an in, not predicated. Yes. Oh, gotcha. So in a sense, the difference between them is kind of like the objective versus the subjective. If you were to think about it like that. I see what you're saying. Okay. Uh, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
yes, you would have to call these things subjective. No one else has access to them, I think. There might be some example of a particular in you that for, no, because there's no substance to it. I can't see off the top of my head why that thinking doesn't work. This is subjective. No one else has these. Because, it makes because they have no substance, yeah. and so no one else can have any other direct experience with them. Yeah, and you can't really say that, like... Yeah, I think, yeah. I, think I get what you're getting at, and I can't think of why that thinking doesn't work. So maybe there's some reason why that doesn't work, but seems like a good way to keep track of it. Okay, the final category and the most important category, those which are not in and not predicated. These are individual substances. These are all the individual objects you are surrounded by. This phone, this marker, me, the whiteboard. Everything you see around you, all those individual objects out there, those are things that are not in anything because they exist in and of themselves. They're not dependent. They're, they have substance. And then they're not predicated of anything. They are the thing. So individual particular things, individual substances, or another word that Aristotle gives them is primary substances. So this is the most important category. What, what does he mean by primary substances? So we'll get into primary substances versus secondary substances. In short, individual men are primary substances. Men, the universal man, is a secondary substance. So secondary substances are what he's going to call this category. These are going to be secondary substances. These are primary substances. These are all the individual particulars out there in reality. These are all the groupings of those individual particulars out there in reality. So it's like the particulars versus the world forms in Plato's theory. Uh, yeah, kind of. So secondary substances are universals whose instances are primary substances. So man is a secondary substance because when I talk about a particular man, it's a primary substance. So a secondary substance is a universal whose primary substance, or sorry, a universal whose instance is a primary substance. Okay. Whose instance, a universal talking where you can finish it like this. We usually can talk about A, that universal. And it makes sense. I see a man, that works. Man is a secondary substance. Man is a universal whose instances are primary substances. It's a secondary substance. Red is not. I can't say I see a red. Doesn't make sense. Can you give me an example of not being not predicated? This one? Yeah. That's it. You, yeah. me, this. So everything you see around you, point your finger. All the individual particular objects that we experience. You do not experience the universal man. You experience individual men. Trying to see how these all correlate. How they all, he's splitting all the basic notions we have up into these four categories. And these two are related with terminology that he's going to give here in a second. He's going to call these primary substances and these secondary substances. So all uh, the secondary substances embody many, many, many primary substances that basically define what the secondary substance is based off of the individual. It's a secondary substance because its instance is a primary substance. A universal whose instance is a primary substance is a secondary substance. So animal is a secondary substance because it's a universal whose primary substance, a particular, or whose instance is a primary substance, a particular animal. I can talk about a animal, and I can show you a animal. I can't show you animal. But yeah, but what, what makes a man is, okay, he has this many limbs, He's well, we'll get to definition. Answer. My point is, is that we can say that is what a universal man is, is the uh, cum culmination of all individual men. Uh, if one all of a sudden another man sprouts an arm, you could be like, okay, now that just redefines what the universal man is. So you're getting into how he does classification, and we'll do that next. That, so that's not classification? Well, you're talking about how we call things men and man. 
So what you're talking about, the definition of the word mean. So when you get to definitions, we have to talk about classification. So he hasn't come up with how he comes up with definitions yet. But he'd say it's through abstraction. You see what a bunch of men have in common, you abstract the universal man. And you don't need to see all of men, you see enough to generalize. Uh, can I ask what he means by predicated and not predicated enough? So the best I could tell you is that predicated is something you can say of it. Something you can say of me is something you can predicate of me. Something that's in me is something that can't exist independent of me. Okay. So when you predicate running of Donnie, you're saying Donnie is running. Mm -hmm. That's something that can be predicated of me. But something that can also be in me in the sense that I'm running and running is something that can't exist independent of me. So it's in me in the sense it can't exist independent of me. You can predicate red of Donnie. You can say Donnie is red. But you can't do it with stuff you can point at, right? But you cannot, or sorry, no, you, right? you, right. you can't predicate Donnie of me. Yeah. I am Donnie. So yeah, anytime you're predicating, you're talking about universals. You're saying a universal applies to something. Okay, so now we did our first swing of those four. Let's come at another way of viewing these. So another way of viewing this classification is to associate predicated with universals and in with accidental. Now accidental, let's focus on that word for a second because while that's a common word for people in philosophy, that's one that we probably don't use the same way that you, we, they do. Uh, so when we say accidental here, we, didn't, we mean it wasn't necessarily the case. So I am accidentally a teacher. There's no reason that I necessarily had to be a teacher. It's an accident of reality that Donald Timpson is a teacher. I could have easily not been a teacher. It just so happened I ended up a teacher. So they kind of associated with coincidental. Uh, kind of. Yeah. I'm accidentally white. I can go get a good tan and become really tan. Or I can go paint myself red, and now I'm accidentally red. It happens to be the case I'm red. Nothing about Donald Timpson necessitates being red. Now I am not accidentally a man. That's not something that just happened to come along and Donald Timpson went on a light way and suddenly he's a man. I am necessarily a man. I have to be a man. It doesn't make sense to talk about Donald Timpson and somehow pull the madness out of that. Okay. So necessary properties would be like madness. I am necessarily a man. I happen to be a teacher. I happen to be versus I necessarily am. I happen to be are accidental, necessarily are not. So accidental versus not accidental. If it's accidental, it's not necessary. It, it, it's like we could imagine it being otherwise. So let's go through these and then hopefully it makes more sense. So another way of viewing this is to predicate it with universal and in with accidental. Note that when we talk about universals, anything non-accidental would be essential. Oh, that's a rare word. Non-accidental versus essential. Essential. Yes. It's, it's a part of my essence. I am essentially a human being. I am not accidentally a human being. I am essentially a human being. That's part of my essence. There's no way to take that away. Yeah. I accidentally have two arms. You can cut them off. Accidental property, essential property. Different things. Okay. Hmm. So let's go at it again. So we have not in, but predicated would be the same thing as essential universals. Universals talking about the essence of a thing. So madness is not in James, but can be predicated of James. Oh, I gave the exact same examples I did on the other page. So madness is an essential universal relative to James. It gets at the essence of what James is. In and predicated would be accidental universals. Geometry is both in and predicated of me accidentally. 
I happen to know geometry. We could imagine a world where Donnie didn't know geometry. You could hit me on the head really hard and I wouldn't know geometry. Right now, I know geometry. It's accidental I know geometry. It is a universal that can be accidentally predicated of me. Accidentally, happens to be the case. And not predicated. These would be accidental particulars. I happen to possess a memory of last class. I happen to know. I happen to have my knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem. I happen to have my memory of what happened last week. Accidental particulars. And then not in, not predicated, are non-accidental particulars. These are all individual particulars. All the things that exist in reality. Primary substances. So that's another way of splitting up the exact same thing. Good? Yeah. Okay. Now, getting to classification. So predicated is closely tied to Aristotle's uh, system of classification. So let's just go over how Aristotle talks about words. We have these words already, which is can make them confusing. We're getting, the words we're going to use over and over again are genus and species. So you need to drop the notion that you already have in your, in your head due to biology about what genus and species mean, because that is not what they mean here. So drop those. They're similar, and you'll see the connection of why those words end up being the case. But for now, drop those words out of your head, and let's restart what they are. So a genus is some collection of things as opposed to others. I know, that's pretty high level, but once we introduce species, it'll come back. And he doesn't really give a definition of what genus is, it's just how he keeps using it. So a genus is a collection of things as opposed to others, and the definition of a species consists in stating its genus and its differentiating specification. So we're gonna look at definitions, and I think that'll help us get genus and species, and then we'll go back to classification. So you should be a bit confused so far, We'll see some examples and it hopefully starts clear. So animal is a genus. It is a collection of all living things capable of movement or self-movement or something to that effect. I don't know exactly how Aristotle defines it. But so animal is a genus. Now let's look at an actual definition. Man is a rational animal. That's Aristotle's definition for man. Man is a rational animal. I'm gonna encode, I'm gonna rewrite the sentence with the exact same information in a way that makes more clear how the genus of species keeps showing up. An animal is a man if it is rational. So animal is a genus here, species is a man, and this is the differentiating, uh, what do we call it? Differentiating specification. So we give genus, species, if it's rational. So every definition is attached to a species. Definitions give us species. We just define the species man in this definition. So we connect the genus to a species in a definition. So genus, animal, man is a subset of an animal. We're defining that subset. And what is man? It's the animals who are rational. Another example. An animal is an elephant if it has a trunk. Definition of elephant now. We're talking about the species elephant. It's another question of things, just like animal was. Genus, species, differentiating specification. In other words, differentiating properties. A way of distinguishing them. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It is typical in modern definitions that the species is often bold and italicized. That sentence is weird. But you see this exact pattern in how we create definitions all the time in your regular textbooks. So in your chemistry textbook, you might have come across something like this, worded a little bit different. I reworded it to follow the exact pattern that we have here. So a reaction is an exothermic reaction. So a reaction is our genus. Exothermic reaction is our species if it liberates heat. Here's our differentiating specification. Genus, species, and anytime we're talking about species, it has a definition. Go ahead. So in a sense, it's like you have a set, and then you have a subset, but that subset is a proper subset because it can't be all of the other sets. Perfect so far. So if this is a genus, then here we have a species, which is a subset of those, but not all of those, mm -hmm. based off some differentiating characteristic. 
Yes, something that distinguishes these things from some of these things. So everything in here is in here, but not everything in here is in here. So maybe I should have drawn the circle like this. Here's our genus, and then we define a species, something that applies to a subset of the genus, but not the whole thing. That's what we do over and over again. So obviously an exothermic reaction is still a reaction. So a reaction is a genus. There's a collection of things in chemistry that are reactions. Then we can talk about subsets of those, exothermic reactions. What subsets are we talking about? We're talking about like this. The definition tells us what subset we're talking about. The definition gives us a species, a subset of a genus. If the definition of genus is a collection of things as opposed to others. It's not its definition. We can't give a definition of genus. So is genus just the highest level of a collection? Uh, we'll, we'll get, hold on to that one more time. Let's focus on definitions. Let me do the next slide, and then I think you'll be good. OK, so let's look at another example. An integer n is even. So even is our species. Our collection is integer. Integer, or that is our genus, species, if there exists some other integer k such that n is equal to 2k, our differentiating characteristic. That might seem like a bit much for those of you who haven't come across a proper definition of even before, but for those of you who took discrete math, that's exactly the definition we use, yeah. moving some words around. But so our modern definitions are still following the exact same pattern that Aristotle used for definition. Now trying to get a better sense of genus and species. It is possible for a genus to also be a species and a species to also be a genus. That's perfectly legal. Okay? Okay. So it's possible that I have like this. So I start with this genus and I define this species. And then I take this as my genus and define this as a species. And I take this as my genus and define this as a species. So it's always a parent. Parent set where you're making these definitions. You still have to be making these definitions. Go ahead. So to keep going off my set notation connection, it's kind of like the reals and then the rationals and then the integers or the naturals and then the integers. Right? You absolutely could then do that. And all context. Yes, when you're creating a definition, the genus is the thing that you're talking about as a whole set and the species is the thing you're talking about that you're defining. Use a genus to define a species. And I can use this as a genus to define a species. I can use this as a genus to define a species. And I can go however I go. So let's look at a more involved example from start to finish to hopefully wrap our head around this whole thing. So let's talk about a triangle. So you go look at the definition of an equilateral triangle. So a triangle, genus, is an equilateral if all three sides are equal of equal length. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's our definition of equilateral triangle. We just created a species equilateral triangle. And it made reference to a higher class triangle. So we had here, do I keep So we had here where we had equilateral triangle, and that was inside the triangle genus. So genus, species so far. Now let's define triangle. A polygon is a triangle if it has three edges and three vertices. So now, polygon was our species in that definition, and this was our, or polygon was our genus, and this was our species. And then we can go out even further, I don't know what the further one out is, plane figure. So plane figure, and then a plane figure is a polygon if it is described by a finite number of straight line segments connected to form a closed polygonal chain. It doesn't matter that we can't really make sense of what all those words mean. The point is, here's its definition, and it's following this exact pattern. We use this pattern for definitions all the time. And that's what Aristotle means when he's talking about genus and species. It's usually related to some definition. The three are all tied together. The genus was a theme, was the the superset that you define that particular set from. Make sense? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's look at a chain once again and ask some questions. 
So we have u right here. Here's u. And then above u, we say you are a human. Then we say a human is a mammal. And then we say a mammal is an animal. And then we might say an animal is a living thing. And we want to ask two questions about this. First off, are you a species? Yes. No. You are not a species. A species no, still has to be a collection of things. Mm -hmm. Still has to be universal. So this is a species right here, but not a genus. This is both a species and a genus. This is both a species and a genus. You with me so far? So the species has to be universal? In so, order for it to be a species? Yes. The species is universal. It's a collection. So a species is universal. It's a collection. You are not a species, but human is a species. Now, when he's talking about this classification, and when you're defining things, you have to define things in terms of their essence. You cannot define things in terms of their accidental properties. So human is, he, he, he doesn't personally have mammal in his chain. He wouldn't have a problem with you sticking some intermediate in between here. He'd have a problem if you tried making a species under human. That's what he'd take issue with. So the way that he's defined human is human is a rational animal. That's getting at what essentially makes a human. It is not the case that just because you find a way of grouping things that happens to encase all humans, that you have a valid definition of human. He would say that's accidental that, that, hap that it's that way. So for example, remember go back to some of the early Platonists, they had a definition for man as a featherless biped. Man is a featherless biped, featherless animal that walks on two legs. Now, it might just so happen to be the case that when they say that, every man on planet Earth, that applies to every man on planet Earth and only every man on planet Earth. And that might be the case. And Aristotle still throws this definition out the window. And the story goes that someone went, plucked a chicken, and said, behold, man, a featherless biped. Aristotle says, no, no, no. It's accidentally the case, when that, when that was said, it might accidentally be the case that everything that's a man, that applies to. But he says, no, definitions need to get at the essence of the thing. Man is not a featherless biped. Man is a rational animal. And, how you, and you need to get at that essence. And you could have you redefined mammal in terms of animal and said, okay, man is a rational mammal. And you'd say, okay, we're still equivalent. That's fine. But then you got man. So if you try to further subdivide humans into uh, whites and blacks, for example, let's ignore all other races for a second, and say, we'll create a definition where a uh, black is a human whose skin is dark or something like that. And we try and come up with a definition like that. Aristotle says, no, that is an accidental property. That is not an essential property. There is nothing essential about that person's being black. So we say, you can't come up with a you can't come up with a species below human. Human is the lowest species in this chain. You can't get any lower. And those things that you couldn't get any lower than we now call species in biology today. And we call genus the thing that happened to be above them in whenever taxonomy was first being done. Go ahead. If, let's say, a monkey becomes rational, would it then now fall in the category of human? Uh, sure. The Aristotle didn't think that was possible. And that's why he considered human being, or sorry, rationality being the essence of Right. He'd say a monkey becoming rational is like a monkey growing a trunk. And that's simply because he felt that that was an essence that cannot be uh, obtained by any other animal. Well, sure, you can say about everything he says. So uh, Why does he think it? Simply because he thinks, yes, that's why he thinks everything. It's like qualification of the same thing. So as long as, long as he feels like something can't be uh, taken or removed from There's that. no other way to get at the essence of human than man. And that is the essence of what makes someone a man. So if I was to take, like, for instance, take it out of humans and like go to a chair, the essence of a chair, uh, you, a chair would be you can sit on it. So if you can't sit uh, on it, it's not a chair. Possibly. 
But is that what that you could say that's the essence of a chair? Well, you'd have to think about it. So the whole point here Aristotle is making is you don't need to make definitions willy nilly. So he has a whole. We haven't gone to his theories on how you make definitions. We just need to briefly cover it here, so that we can talk about genus and species and make genus and species make sense. So he has a whole series of rules on what you have to follow in order to come up with a proper definition. And you can't throw it out really nilly. You can't just flat out say, well, I want chair to mean uh, anything you can sit on and have that be the definition for whatever that is. He says you can use the word chair however you want. Chair is just a word. But the essence of a thing is the essence of a thing. And you either have the right opinion about it or you don't, but its essence is its essence. Hmm. Well, so is it understood nowadays that perhaps essence, there is no, nothing which, nothing really has an essence in itself, as far as the species thing. <laughs> well, that's, what's understood today, philosophy is a big piping pile of garbage today, big heaping pile of garbage, and everyone says everything about everything. So, there is no... We, there is not this notion of philosophy slowly progressing like you can think about physics slowly progressing. Yeah, so you it's just ideas develop and branch out and branch out and branch out and branch out. And so there's a big web of philosophy today. Not more developed ideas down the same vein. Some people do come back and clean up Aristotle as he goes. So there is some work down that vein. But a lot more of the work is just branching off in all sorts of directions. Because it's a lot easier. Yeah, and not only that, but Math is one of the fields where it's easiest to say whether something's true or false. To have agreement about that, yes. Okay. Okay. So the chain of things. Now the big question. So we got down here you. We can't go further than human if we're getting at you. But what about going up the chain? Can we go up the chain forever? No, I'm sure there's some sort of limit. Some sort of limit. How far up could we go? The universe, or the one that they talk about is being. And we can have being, the first genus, right? And then we can start with being, and then start subdividing after that, and we'd be good. Right? Being, everything in existence, anything, that kind of thing, that could be our first genus, right? Well, Aristotle says, no. <laughs> because a genus has to differentiate some things from other things. It has to be distinguishing. So, he's going to come up with 10 initial genuses. He's going to come up with the 10 initial categories, which is why this is called the categories, that we start with in our initial genuses and then build down from. So that's why it's called the categories. He's saying there isn't just one limit. He's saying there's multiple. Ultimately, this thing will come back to one of these. Since we have you, a physical entity here, then this is actually going to come back to the category he calls substance. For the particular chain we chose. Does that and that's going to be one of his 10 categories. Is that, can the 10 categories be like in connection with one another or are they completely separate? It, it builds down. If we, there was no way to get from you to a different, a different category. Quantity over here. Yeah. A different category. Quantity would have been dealing with intuitively mathematical concepts and objects and those abstractions. Is it, would you consider like these fields? Of study? Uh, no. Ways we use words is ways classified here. The ways we use words gotcha. and defining words. <laughs> so a lot about language, a lot about how we use words, and how we talk about things. Because we gotta have agreement about how we use words before we can even get to logic and how we can start. Well, first it's how we use words, then how we build sentences to talk about things being the case. And then logic, how we use sentences to produce new sentences. So, you saw the building this up. That stops over here. Okay, so how far back can we go? Our 10 initial categories. Now, he's kind enough to, in one short sentence, give us a brief intuition into what each of these are before we delve into them deeper. So, here's what he says. A thing said without combination, so we're still talking about simple speech. Not complex speech with structure, we're still just on simple speech. So a thing said without any combination, each signifies, represents, signifies, 
either substance, that's one category, or quantity, or qualification, or a relative, relative, well, we'll give intuition for each of these, or where, or when, or being in a position, except for in one Greek word, <laughs> or having, or doing, or being affected. To give a rough idea of each, examples of substance are man and horse. Of quantity, four foot, five foot. Of qualification, white, grammatical. Of relative, double half, larger. Of where, in the Lyceum, the Lyceum was the name of the school. In the marketplace, of when, yesterday, last year. Of being in a position, is lying down, is sitting. Of having, has shoes on, has armor on. Of doing, cutting, burning. Of being affected, being cut, being burned. Notice those two go hand in hand. That's an important thing to catch pretty early on. Doing is afflicting something. And then the other is afflicting you, being affected. So doing is cutting and burning, but being affected is being cut or being burned. None of the above is said just by itself of any affirmation. What does he mean by affirmation? Affirmation is a sentence that says something's true. The sky is blue. That's an affirmation. Okay, so he's saying we're just talking about simple speech. Reminding you, we're not talking about statements. We're talking about still just simple speech. So none of the above is said just by itself in any affirmation, but by the combination of these, with one another, an affirmation is produced. You need to combine simple speech to produce an affirmation. I cannot call horse true or false. I cannot call forefoot true or false. The man is forefoot. When I start to combine these things, then we can start applying true or false. So affirmations are constructed on these things. So none of the above is said just by itself in any affirmation, but by the combination of these with one another, an affirmation is produced. For every affirmation, it seems, is either true or false. But a thing said without any combination, none is either true or false. You can't call man true or false, white true or false, bronze true or false, winds true or false, burning true or false, etc. So still just talk about simple speech. Any questions on that? Well, Except for what the ten categories are. Yeah, I am very curious. We'll delve into each of them and give a sense of what they are. So any high-level questions before we jump into each of them? Because we'll go through each of the ten. No? Okay. So, let's get an idea of each of them. And far and away, the most important category in there was substance. Because remember, in our square, come back to our square, we had predicated and not predicated we had in and we had not in. And we create our square right here. So if it's not in and not predicated, this box, this was primary substances. Which still fall under the category substance. And if it was uh, predicated and not in, it was a secondary substance. And now you know why he gave it this name. He calls these primary substances and these secondary substances because they both ultimately fall under the substance category. Yeah. And as we did our chain of classification down from substance all the way down, it was a secondary substance, secondary substance, secondary substance. As long as we were talking about genus and species, we were talking about secondary substances until we finally got to you, a primary substance. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, two of these are completely covered by one category. The other nine categories are always talking about these. <laughs> Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, now you know why substance is far and away the most important category. So, we'll focus on that one first. So, substance is subdivided into two. We have the primary substances and the secondary substances. Primary substance, that which cannot be predicated of anything or be said to be in anything, or individual particular entities out there in existence. They're day-to-day -day things that you experience all the time. Point, that's primary substance. 
Secondary suffixes. Those that can be predicated of something, but still cannot be in anything. Animal, man, but not wife. That's not an example. Wife's not an example, brain not an example, man and animal, those are secondary subjects. I think you guys got that. Okay. Now, things that are primary substances are either predicated of the primary substances as subjects or in them as subjects. So let's make sense of that real quick. So you get how secondary substances are always predicated of primary substances, right? Let's draw a chain again. Uh, we'll just start with like living thing and see what you think here. Living thing, then we'll go to animal, then we'll go to man, and then we'll go to you. So secondary substance is a species. Secondary substance is a species or, uh, genus. what's the other word? Genus, thank you. Genus. That ultimately leads to a primary substance. It has to be in one that ends in a primary substance. Because it doesn't necessarily. So let's follow this for a second. An example of what he means by predicate. He's saying man can be predicated of you, animal can be predicated of you, living thing can be predicated of you. I can say Peter is a living thing. I can say Peter is an animal. I can say Peter is a man. All those are true. Everything that we can say about living things, we can also say about you. Well, notice we can always say everything about the higher one. I can also call all men living things. I can also call all animals living things. I can call all men animals. And I can call you all those things. Okay. So, things that aren't primary substances are either predicated of the primary substances as subjects. This is predicated of it, that is predicated of it, that is predicated of it. Everything here is predicated of these things. Okay. Or, in them as subjects. Here's the primary things. Everything that's not in this box either right here, or it's in something, or in them. So that in it takes care of this category and this category. What do we mean when we say that these things are in? We mean that they're in something. Running can't exist except for in a particular thing like me, Donnie. Redness can't just exist. You can't just have red. You need red something. Something has to be red. You have to talk about a red something. It has to be in something. You can't just have my memory of last week floating out there in the ether. Here it is. It has to be in me. Memory doesn't exist independent of me. So notice how secondary substances are always predicated of a primary substance. And these two categories are always in a primary substance. That's the important part here. So if the primary substances did not exist, it would be impossible for any of the other things to exist. If I get rid of this category, none of the other categories make any sense anymore. They were all in some way talking about this category. And that's really how he argues Plato's point, right? This is how he is opposite Plato. Yeah. Plato says, the universals are real. They exist out there forever, eternally, and we happen to be imitations of them, right? There was the world of forms, there was the void, the demiurge, whatever that is, set things in motion somehow to start reflecting the world of forms into the void, creating us, these things, these individual substances. And somehow we are a byproduct of these other things. Aristotle says, no, no, no. These are the primary substances. If you don't have these, it doesn't make sense to talk about anything else. Reality is composed of primary substances. This is what comes first. This is what's primary. So, if the primary substances did not exist, it would be impossible for any of the other things to exist. We can imagine a world existing without red. That's fine. We can get rid of some of these categories. That's fine. Doesn't matter. What we can't get rid of is the primary substances. If you get rid of this, nothing else makes sense. Okay, so focus on individual particulars rather than universals. Let's see, what do we have here? I think here I'm just specifying stuff we already said. 
not in not predicated, our primary substances, not in but predicated, our secondary substances. So when we're talking about in and predicated or not predicated, so the other two categories, so I'm saying the exact same thing here. So uh, primary substances were not in and not predicated, that takes care of one square. Not in but predicated is secondary substances, still related to primary substances. So the last two categories, which is in and predicated and in and not predicated, they have to be in something, i.e. a primary substance. Which I think you guys already got. Okay. Substance continued. Before we get to the next category. Substances don't admit of degree. This is very important. Substances do not admit of degrees. All men are equally men. You are not more man than me. I am not more man than you. If something's a human, it's a human, period. You can't make it less human or more human. Let's make them a little bit more human or a little bit less human. This is another way that he drastically differs from Plato. Remember, Plato says you're just a shadow of manness. And you can make that a better shadow or a worse shadow. You can be more real man or less real man. And if you got to sacrifice some of the lesser men for some of the better men, so be it. We're after manness with Plato's perspective. Aristotle says, no, 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 we're all just equally man. You can't say one is more equally man than another. Anymore, you can say that's more of a horse than that is of a horse. They're both just horse. They are a horse. So you see how he's laying the foundations here for equal rights amongst individuals. That's what he's laying a foundation for right here in his metaphysics. So John Locke very much continues the Aristotelian thought of politics. When he says all men have a right to life, liberty, and property by virtue of being man, it's metaphysically founded in the doctrine that all men are equally men and not one man is more of a man than another man. They're all just men. We're all just people. You have human rights, rights that you have in virtue of being human. You can't become more human, and therefore those rights apply to you more than some other person. There's no varying degrees. A human's a human. So, very important metaphysical point, which is obviously going to be related to this politics, so I'm going to stress it here. It is distinctive of substance that what is numerically one and the same is able to receive contraries. So this is another way that substances vary from these other ones. So... When we talk about admitting of degrees, uh, you can have something be more or less white, more or less red, more or less quick, more or less. So degrees exist with a lot of words. He says it's a special case that when we're talking about things like this, that they don't admit of degrees. So substances do not admit of degrees, but it is also the distinctive characteristics of substances that when you talk about one particular individual substance, it is still able to receive contraries. Now this is setting up for how he's going to deal with Parmenides and Heraclitus. I can at one point be sick, and at another point be healthy. Those are two contrary things that can apply to me at different points. Health cannot at one point be sick, and at one point be healthy. Health is health. It can't be contrary. But me, a substance, I can take on, receive contraries. I can be at one point good, and at another point bad. So it's unique to substances that they can have these contrary properties. None of the other things that we talk about can have these contrary properties. And remember when you talk about substances, you talk about both primary and secondary substances. Substance. So two very important properties of substances that we'll definitely be making reference to as the class continues. Okay, and that finishes substance. Any questions on substance before we go to the next category? That's the most involved one by far. These will get simpler. Okay, so let's go to the next one. The next category he calls quantity. And quantity he also subdivides into two, continuous and discrete quantities. And if you think about continuous as like how we study continuity and calculus and discrete as in what we study in discrete math, you're right on tune with how we think for those of you who have done that. Okay, now what does Aristotle mean by continuous and discrete? Let's give some rough intuition and it goes back to, oh, we never proved it. We didn't prove in this class that the square root of 2 is irrational. But you know that the square root of 2 is irrational, right? We proved that in discrete. We proved it in discrete math, but we were going to do it in this class when we did Pythagoras, and we decided not to for 
uh, the sake of time. But roughly speaking, from the Pythagorean theorem, we get that if this side is 1 and this side is 1, then this side is the square root of 2. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So 1 squared plus 1 squared equals square root of 2 squared. Everyone good with this? OK. So the thing that we skipped over that we didn't prove, so you just have to take, it, take my word for it, is that you cannot find two integers, two whole numbers, a and b, such that a over b is equal to the square root of 2. You can get as close as you want, but you can never actually find two integers such that this is the case. You with me? Mm -hmm. So square root of 2, what is that roughly? Like 1.41, I don't know how it continues. So you'll notice that 141 over 100 is a good approximation, but not quite. And we can get a closer and closer approximation, but we can never perfectly get the square root of 2 represented as a fraction like this. OK, so these fractions right here are what the Greeks think of as numbers. They didn't think to call the square root of 2 a number. So they knew that they could construct the square root of 2. They knew how to construct a triangle and talk about the square root of 2. So for some reason, geometry could deal with this entity, but their algebra couldn't, which is why you'll probably have noticed in your classes that, that the Greeks do a lot of geometry, not a lot of arithmetic. Why? Because to their minds, geometry could simply talk about quantities that arithmetic couldn't, because arithmetic only talks about numbers. They never thought to call that thing, just call it a number and continue on their merry way. That was a leap forward. need uh, like numbers that much to do geometry the old way. Uh, you don't use any numbers when you do geometry the old way. The combination of geometry with number is called analytic geometry, and Rene Descartes is one pretty much credited with kicking that off. Some people did some basic work before him, but he really put the system down. And he's like almost 2,000 years after you would. So it took a long time to say, no, actually, these can talk about the same things and do it. But anyways, so now when he's talking about discrete quantities, he's pretty much talking about things we can assign numbers to. When he's talking about continuous quantities, he's talking about the types of things we can construct in geometry. That gives you pretty good intuition for what he's talking about here. Is it like the difference? So, modern definition for a uh, discrete set. Not, not quite, but gives you a good intuition. The rationals, or any subset of rationals, are discrete sets. Or anything equivalent in size. Okay. So the set ABC is a discrete set because it's the same size as 1, 2, 3, which is a subset of the rational. So the rationals, any subset of the rationals, or any set the same size as any subset of the rationals, would be considered a discrete set. Okay. And then the real numbers are continuous. Okay. So discrete and continuous. Let's talk about some examples now. So continuous quantities. Lengths of lines, areas, volumes, intervals of time, distances. Etc. Think you got some good intuition? Basically, things you can construct in geometry. Continuous quantities. Quantities with no gaps. See, they understood that because the square root of 2 isn't a number, then when I have two numbers, there has to be like a gap between them, is the way they would have thought about it. If I were to plot all the numbers on the number line, there must be gaps between them. It doesn't fill in all the spaces like we do in geometry. So, continuous quantities fill in all the spaces. Discrete quantities seem to have gaps between them. It's another way to try and make sense of it. Now, note something. It's funny because even expert philosophers get so confused right here. This is one that is, would be obvious to you if you went through Euclid's elements, but if you haven't, then you'd get confused, and they do get confused. I noticed everyone who talks about this, so I'll make this known. Now, he says, lines, surfaces, and bodies. Ah, and I said, lines, areas, and volumes. There's a lot of argument as to what he actually meant. He meant lines, areas, and volumes. Now, it just so happens that the Greeks would say something along the lines of this is equal to this, if you study Euclid's elements, 
if they have the same area. He would call those two things equal if they have the same area. Now we, when we say equal, we mean they're actually the exact same thing. Yeah. And he'd say, no, that's just congruent. So it's just understood that when we're talking about equal, we're talking about the areas. And it's just understood. Because there's nothing else that that could mean. So it's a laziness that was adopted that everyone just knew that's what you were talking about. So he is talking about the same way that when they say that those two are equal, they're not really saying those are identical things. They're saying, no, it's understood I'm talking about the areas. I'm talking about these two surfaces being equal. So he means lines, areas, and volumes. You don't have to be confused like so many people are. Intervals of time, distances, etc. OK, what do we, we mean by discrete quantities? Numbers. Remember for the Greeks, numbers are rational numbers. Numbers and rational numbers are the same thing. Fractions of integers. That's the Greek notion of a number right now, which are all discrete. Uh, a funny example he gives is speech. Now, speech for him is he thinks about speech as composed of syllables. There's discrete syllables. A word has so many syllables, so many sounds you say when you say a word. And that's discrete. You have this syllable, then this syllable, then this syllable. Well, there's another more strange example that he gives. Okay, so that's quantities. Uh, let's see one more. Quantities have the distinct characteristic of being related by the terms equal and unequal. So you can't, with any other terms, talk about whether or not they're equal versus unequal. Quantity is the only place where we can actually do that. So I can't say that this red is somehow equal to this red without somehow applying quantity. You might say, yeah, you can. You can talk about the frequency of their light and see if it's the same frequency. And they're talking about quantity. You turn it to a mathematical object to represent the light. So if you're talking about equal versus unequal, you're talking about quantities. And so if I say, hmm, is that desk equal to that desk? Implied in my speech somehow is a quantity that we can talk about. What do I mean by, are those desks equal? Am I saying, is the height of those desks equal? The height of the desk is a quantity. Am I saying, is the area of those desks equal? The area of those desks is a quantity. So quantity, we split into being equal versus being unequal, with the unequal being greater than or less than. We can talk about being greater than or less than. Quantities also do not admit of con contraries. Special property about contraries. What's the contrary of six? Nothing? You can't come up with anything that might make a good idea? The reciprocal. Which reciprocal? Yeah. I assume you meant inverse. And so you have the additive inverse or the multiplicative inverse. Why is one more special than the other? So someone might actually think negative six, but any argument you can make for negative six, I can also make for one six. Because one six plays the exact same role as negative six, just with a different operator. So there is no contraries for numbers. They don't admit contraries. On the other hand, give you an example of things that do admit of contraries. What's the contrary of black? Why? Why? What's the contrary of good? Evil. Bad, evil. We'd say those are synonyms. Can't be the same idea. Contraries is opposite, right? Uh, we will break down how we use the word opposite. <laughs> There's four ways we use the word opposite. Oh, wow. And he has to break that down because you'll notice a lot of the times Plato makes arguments along the lines of, is this unjust? No. Well, then it's just, right? Is this good? No. Well, then it's evil. And he always plays on the fact that, he always ignores the fact that, what about a spectrum? Can't there be something that's not good or evil? So Aristotle breaks down what we mean by opposite, and he talks about four different ways. So if that's not opposite, what does it mean? Contrary is one of the ways that we use the word opposite. So opposite has four meanings. Oh. Contrary is one of those meanings. So, so sometimes when we say opposite, we mean the contrary. So you're saying, it, what he's saying is that six, negative six is not, con, I'm sorry, six is not contrary to negative six or whatever. Right. And that we just decided that that was the case, but it has no foundation. Well, what do you mean that? It doesn't make sense to talk about the contrary of six as negative six. Any argument you can make for that, I can make the same argument for one six. Give you an example of one where you can make the argument for. How opposed to good can you get? Evil. There could be neutral in between, but the contrary of good is evil. White light, if we think about white light as containing 
every possible combination of photons, and black as being no photons. Now we can talk about those as contrary to each other. Contrast. Contrary. contrary. They are contrary to each other. Black is the contrary of white. Black is not the contrary of blue, gray, or green. It's the contrary of white. Yes. Now he'd say maybe blue has a contrary, maybe it doesn't. We can leave that to experts, but an obvious one that everyone knows, black is the contrary of white. And I don't need to explain it to you, you all just know. And it's not a freak coincidence that when I say, what's the contrary of good, everyone says bad. <laughs> mm. I hope I'll understand it more later. Well, you'll understand it. You will. Yeah, we'll get into contrary more later as we get into discovering what we mean by opposite. Okay, uh, we talked about all those. Relative or relation is the next category. Relative or relation states how one object is related to another. These are predicates. Another way to think about it is predicates that require two terms to make sense. It has to be talking about two things. It can't just be talking about one thing. I can talk about a red marker. I can't talk about, uh, well, we'll just get into these now to give you an example. Require two terms to make sense. So examples, double. Double is a relative term. I need x is double what? It's double y. I need two terms to make double make sense. Greater. If I say x is greater than, if I say two is greater than, greater than what? Three. If I say Donnie is taller than, taller than what? Need another term. So taller would be a relative term. Greater, relative term, double, half. Uh, now, he gives a good uh, He goes into relatives with a bit of explanation. And so he talks about how we need to be a little bit careful. Sometimes we might be talking about relatives when we're not really. So he talks about what he calls proper relative. He says, one of the things that can help you keep track of the fact that you're talking about a proper relative is that it will have a co-relative, the relative that goes the other way. If A is somehow related to B, then B should also be related to A. You should be able to go back and forth in that relation. So double is a proper relative because it has a co-relative, namely half. Greater is a proper relative because it has uh, another relative, less. Greater and less. Less being its co-relative. Make sense? Yeah. Relative. Uh, Is my camera still going? I just remembered I had an yeah, I so. issue on my phone with memory, which is what I'm worried about. So we'll try to stop tonight and recall there because I don't think we'll get through all the categories. Next one, qualification or quality. Now this is one that we've already talked about quite a bit. Um, if you can think back all the way to, uh, who was it? Who came after Empedocles? Anaxagoras. The seeds of everything and everything. Oh, yeah. You remember that guy? And the way that he made that argument was based off of the qualities a thing possesses. The qualities a thing possesses. So a property possessed by an object, that's just giving you intuition. That's not what Aristotle says. Examples, white, black, sweet, bitter, hot, cold. So like adjectives? Qualities. I'm not sure if every adjective works, but Probably, but when we're talking about the qualities, we were talking about the properties that the atomists said don't exist, and the things that uh, Anaxagoras was using to argue his philosophy that there has to be infinite different types of things, infinite one stuffs, right? So you might remember going back to uh, uh, the atomists. The atomists thought that all qualities exist by convention. So the famous saying by uh, Democritus was something to the effect of by convention sweet, by convention bitter, by convention hot, by convention cold, in reality, atoms in the void. Yeah. Those things exist by conventions. The thing he was saying only exists by conventions were the qualities of things. So we've been talking a lot about qualities of things for a long time. We talked about the four uh, basic elements being fire, water, earth, and air, and then there are four fundamental qualities, dry, wet, hot, cold. And the two qualities that something exhibits that takes the element. For example, fire is hot and dry. Those are the two qualities exhibited by fire. So using quality, 
much the same way that quality has been being used for philosophy all the way back. Good on that one? Okay. We'll finish the slide in a bit, then we turn. Where or place, this one makes perfect sense, your position in relation to your surrounding environment. You are in the Lyceum. You are in the marketplace. It's telling where you are located. And you always have to talk about where you are located relative to something. Remember we talked about position is relative. There's no such thing as your absolute position. There's no way for me to say exactly where Peter is. Even if I give his longitude, latitude, and altitude, that's where you are relative to the center of the Earth. Well, if some alien is trying to find it, I need to tell him now where the Earth is. I can tell you where it is relative to the sun. I can tell you where the sun is relative to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. I can tell you where the Milky Way galaxy is relative to its surrounding neighbors. How do I know the alien knows any of those? How do I tell the alien where I am? Wouldn't you say all of these are relative? Even qualification and time? Would I say all of these are relative? What I'm saying is that you Position is relative. Yeah, so is time. Like you, the time is you can't you can't say in time. It, the only way to mention from something in time is to reference it from a, another time. Like it, you know. It's just what I'm saying is that uh, position, time, yes, relative to the course of events. Uh, the only way that I could think that that might differ is if we all had good enough measurements, we could talk about the start of the universe and then count. Waves of a photon since. But what if time exists? But that's, that's, ignoring, yeah. uh, that's so, ignoring that's uh, ignoring Einstein. Yeah. Einstein tells us that distance is a space and distance is a time are both relative. And another one is even qualification and quantum quality. Because you can't have white if you do not comprehend what black is. You don't even know what white is. It's like what is white? Well it's not black. Uh, that one is not as true. Could you give me an example? Um, I think there's people who are colorblind who don't see something like red. I don't know what you would say not red is, but... Exactly. So, like, for instance, a fish might be the first, the last animal to discover what water is. Because it doesn't know what water is until it goes up and gets a breath of air. Not... Contrast can help make some, help something make sense to you, but you don't always need, you don't have to have contrast. If you saw the entire world as everything being red. Then you wouldn't know what red is. Well, you don't have anything to contrast it to, My but point. red is what you see. It, you would not comprehend it, possibly. Uh, it'd be cool to find an example. I think a blind person comprehends that they don't see. They don't know what colors are, they can't comprehend. They don't know what colors are, but they know what not color is. What they see. That's not necessarily <laughs> true. Actually, a blind man described the essence of being blind. He had been sighted and he lost his sight. And he said, if people think of it as flatness and you close your eyes and that's how you're blind, he said, no, it's not even that. It is something you just don't even come. It's like the nose you don't see. It's just simply not there. You, if you could think of looking out the back of your head, that's what it would be. Yeah. Well, it's like the saying. More but the follow what she's saying there, for example. Look at you. Can you comprehend what it means to be blind? I yes. cannot. Well, you can try. Well, I, I can. I, can I think I can it. comprehend what it's like to be blind. You can say that. Right? I see out my eyes, but I see out the back of my knees. Well, well that's being blind. If you were to tell a blind person, uh, you know, red is like hot. Like, oh, interesting. Well, that's just an analogy. Exactly. She just gave me an analogy. I still don't comprehend it. No, she said that the analogy people often use is false. Uh, right, but her analogy of, of our analogy being false and what it actually is, is something I still can't Here remember. is exactly what a blind person sees. A blind person sees exactly what you see out the back of your head right now. Nothing. There you go. But you can comprehend that. <laughs> it, it gives you more insight to experience it, of course, but it's not like you have no comprehension of it. Well, okay, you're right. I have a comprehension of what I'm seeing and what I don't see. Because what, what it would I be see. to not see. What, so you only see one side of the coin, <laughs> and you can still comprehend the other. Yeah. Well, to some extent. I'm not the, saying that the experience doesn't add, but no. I was saying that all things are demonstrated through a sense of true contrast. 
And so I'm just gonna throw it out there as possible that quality and quality are also a position in relation. Position in relation. When or time, position in relation to the course of the event, yes. And so it's quality. Yes, position in relation to surrounding environment, position in relation to the course of events. Correct. And quality. And qualification. <laughs> so I'm saying. You're trying to say that you always need the contrast. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure how to even nail down exactly what you're saying because contrast helps. Yes, contrast helps. But it's essential. <laughs> it's essential to what end? For a perfect understanding, is perfect understanding even achievable? It, will the more it gives you better. more insight, okay, but, but you didn't have no insight prior. With one, with one comprehension, you can't comprehend it. Anyways, I don't want to think the whole process. Yeah, I think you're trying to uh, control it too much. It's not as black and white as you're trying to make it. I would like to see You don't have to, I'm just saying that it'd be cool if someone could. Anytime we think we get intuition from an analogy, it's kind of like this is working. Does analogy communicate something to you? Yes, it helps you understand things that you haven't personally experienced. It happens all the time. Yeah. So analogies are doing this, it's giving you insight. So you do have some comprehension. I may always be opposed to no comprehension. A fish has no comprehension of water. I completely disagree with that. It knows it's, it can swim in. It swims. It still doesn't know it's water. Well, it doesn't call it what you call it, sure. But it's still experiencing it and coming to have properties of it. And if we were to tell a fish, hey, by the way, this stuff is water. Tell me some things you can do with water. I, I, I can swim. Uh, I, I can breathe. I can eat. I can do all sorts of things. All the things I've been doing. Can you comprehend? So my question to you, can you comprehend? Can you comprehend not being in the atmosphere? You've never not been in the atmosphere. Can you comprehend it? I sure can. Yeah, because I understand the contrast through observation. For instance, if we've never been out of space, we probably would not. You've never been to out of space. Someone told you. You just heard stories. You have never experienced it. What do you find? All you heard is stories. What's the difference between pictures and like seeing it visually? And experiencing it? Yeah. Your senses so in the experience. To someone you. told you it. Someone communicated it to you with words. You don't have to take the fish out of water for them to understand what water is. So here's my question. You can just explain to them. Can you comprehend it. something? Without experience, not been it. Can I comprehend something that no one's ever comprehended? No. Can you comprehend something that's never changed to what it? Meaning it's always that way forever, and you it never has not been that way. Can you comprehend something that that, that that way? Can you can you comprehend something that literally has never not existed as it as the state that you observed it or said through your senses? Sure. I can comprehend nothing, and everything has always existed. Stuff has always existed, I can comprehend non-existence. It's never been the case that there's non-existence. It's always been existence. I still comprehend nothing. Well, that's until you still have contrast. You have existence and non-existence. Where do I have non-existence? Well, Point to it. Show me something that you can comprehend <laughs> that has no contrast. <laughs> okay, what's the contrast to six? What's the contrast to prime? It's not reality. What's the contrast to a number? It's not, re it's not a qualitative quantitative thing, is, or is it? Qualitative. Oh, you're saying always in here. Yeah, I'm saying comprehend. Oh, well, these are qualities. So you're saying come up with one that's a quality, which is something that objects have accidentally. So these are accidental. These are always in this property. So things that they have accidentally, but make them essential so that they never change, and then comprehend them in this category. No, I can't do that. Okay. So because those things aren't in here. If it was that, it would be in here. So, in our perspective, hot would never exist if we did not understand what cold was. It couldn't, we couldn't comprehend it as a word. Well, it doesn't make sense for this to exist and not this. Exactly. This is more energy, and you can't have more without less, so. Contrast has to be there. Otherwise, if it was always the exact same <laughs> okay. picture. If you're saying Qualities always have contrast. Yes, you're right. What if everything That's for instance, was always the same temperature? You're trying to say what if everything in this category, or what if there were things in this category that weren't in this category? Then they're not in this category. No, they are in that category. For instance, okay, you're right. You're trying to make it something that's not in this category. You're saying find something for me in this category that doesn't work for the things in this category. <laughs> no. 
I'm saying that let's say okay, we, we're done. Yeah, I apologize. This is no longer productive. Okay. Last one, when time, okay, and it needs to be relative to the course of events. So we say yesterday, last year, this morning. Now, one that I notice people sometimes get confused upon is how come time isn't the same thing as quantity? So in quantity, we talked about intervals of time. Two seconds is a quantity. Yesterday falls under when or time. So one's an interval of time, one is a position in time relative to the course of events. Well, there's a distinction there to be made. Five hours does not fall under time. Five hours is a quantity. Yesterday is not a quantity. Yesterday is a position in time. Just like 10 meters is not a position. 10 meters is not a place. 10 meters might be some measurement of some place. So similar thinking there. So five hours does not fall in this category, just like five years does not fall in this category. Those are quantities. Make sense? So I think that was the biggest gotcha with those ones. Uh, so we'll call it there and continue in the categories next time. Okay. And now we can talk.